afternoon and good morning to those joining us out west. I'm Karen Langdon with the National Emergency Management Association. I'd like to welcome you to the NEMA Empowerment eLearning Series. We're very excited to showcase the expertise of some of our members in this series. And today we're happy to present From Automation to Simulation, Applied Innovation for Emergency Managers. A big, big thank you to KPMG for supporting today's topic. Thank you again for being with us today. And now it's my pleasure to pass the session to our moderator, Sean Talmadge. Welcome, Sean, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Karen. And I'm super excited uh, today to talk about something I'm, I'm deeply passionate about, and that's uh, innovation and le leveraging technology. But before we get to that, I'd like to take a moment to go round robin and introduce our, our panelists today. Again, I'm Sean Talmadge. I'm the Director of Emergency Management here in uh, Virginia. Been in the public safety space for a couple of decades and kind of grew up at the local and state level. And at the same time, I was a National Guardsman as a reservist and deployed a couple of times. So, um, and I've had the pleasure of working with uh, bosses that gave me a large sandbox to play in. And, and I'm the, I got an idea type person. So. Uh, really excited about today's uh, uh, topic. And so I'd like to go to Chris uh, just for a quick introduction. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Sean. Chris Gottlieb here, uh, partner with KPMG. I lead our supply chain uh, practice for the state and, lo state and local government sector. Um, it, it, here at KPMG, that role covers everything from procurement to inventory management, warehouse operations, distribution logistics throughout the whole end-to-end -end supply chain. Uh, personally, my, my area of focus is on supply chain analytics, so um, I, I tend to be uh, touching and involved in some of the more cutting edge solutions that, um, that, that, that we're working on and uh, some, of what we'll be, some of which we'll be talking about today. So look forward to the conversation. Hey, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that intro. Hey, Bobby, you're next up. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Bobby Grantla, I'm a managing director in our Data and analytics practice, uh, I focus completely on helping state and government um, agencies and trying to find ways to do analytics, technology enablement, um, finding innovation and creative ways to solve some of their biggest and complex challenges. Um, so I've been working with state and uh, emergency departments for over three, four years now. And so hopefully uh, you'll resonate with some of the complex use cases that we have that we have here to talk about. So pleasure. Uh, thank you, Bobby. And finally, uh, Samantha. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Samantha Sicard with KPMG. I'm a manager in our forensics practice, uh, mostly focused in our state and local government with emergency management and disaster recovery. Thank you, Samantha. We're, we're excited to have you on the panel. So folks, uh, here's our today's agenda. Uh, uh, some open remarks, some introductory remarks, uh, followed by two, two sections, one on uh, AI and kind of the financial management perspective. And then uh, we're gonna discuss uh, the supply chain di digital twin. And so just as a, a quick uh, set in the foundation, you know, here in Virginia, we, we've been really excited about leveraging innovation. And uh, we've done very interesting things with unmanned aerial systems, developing systems to track unmanned aerial systems, IP-based solutions for radio interoperabilities. Um, but what we're seeing is a conversion of technology. And now we're seeing next gen 911, artificial intelligence, the cloud, internet of things. And so ladies and gentlemen, we're a really important time in our history. And this is a real opportunity uh, to be successful. I, I strongly believe that emergency managers and crisis leaders must seek opportunities to work smarter and be more uh, efficient. Um, and, and part of that is considering innovative solutions uh, to face those, uh, to help us with the challenges that we face on a daily basis. So today I'm super excited to moderate uh, today's panel. We've got some great uh, experts and some innovators. So let's get, let's get started. Let's go to the next slide. Um, thanks, Sean. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, that was, that was a great buildup, by the way. Um, so our goal here is really to sort of bring a level of uh, foresight and just visibility into what some of these short, short and long-term goals might be for your emergency uh, management across your agencies. I've been working with, as I alluded to, a government agency for about five to seven years, was really in the focusing on private sector, focusing on the same things, technology, innovation, AI capabilities in, in, in the private sector. And I moved into government about five to seven years ago and, just, and, and, and three to four years with state emergency department agencies. And I'm just honestly just so amazed about what you all do and how much you do that 
I really think some of the learnings that we have in the private sector can honestly be brought over into the government sector, into the areas that y'all focus on. We know agencies uh, face an increased amount of challenges. Um, uh, next slide, Chris. Sorry. We know um, agencies face an increased amount of challenges from the amount of data that you have to your complex business processes from dis pre-disasters to post-disasters to even during a disaster. And so there's so much to think about. There's so much to worry about. There's so much to handle and process that we need to find creative ways Sorry, using innovation George. and capabilities. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Thank you, Karen. Um, so we know I, I'll, I'll, we, we know we have a lot. Uh, Y'all do so much, and there's got to be better ways to to help that. So next slide, please, Chris. So in our innovation journey, if I take a look at what we've been doing um, across government in many different agencies, not just in emergency management but elsewhere, we know that there are um, there's a lot that's going on. We know in private and public sectors there's an unprecedented change in the use of technology to solve problems. We know the amount of data that has varied from very simple things from like Excel worksheets to database tables, everything that's so structured and easy to find and, 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 and navigate to more complex things like unstructured documentation, like paper, your PDFs, your pictures, even maps that you collect today to be able to understand where disasters have happened. We've got more uh, maturity in our devices from like uh, drones and other kinds of sensors to collect that kind of data that's from the, the environment and try to make sense of all of that to potentially analyze the impact of a disaster, to potentially to identify cost recovery methods. All of that has just uh, been escalated to, to, to unprecedented um, um, growth in terms of the use of data and technology and innovation and things of that nature. The rise of automation has also increased in, in government. Um, we know in the heart of a disaster, we need to have ways that allow our first responders and other uh, employees to be able to collect the data then, right, and then, not to remember what was going on in the heat of the moment, come back to their to their office, uh, uh, document it, and bring it back into some kind of a repository to then act on it. So all of this has changed um, in the in the in terms of our growth pattern, in terms of what needs to be done. And what hasn't stopped is our disasters hasn't stopped. I believe prior to this pandemic in 2017, um, there was about $300 billion of, of spend on disasters. And that was on a number of, of natural impacts across the country and unprecedented timelines. Next slide, Chris. So with all of that said, there's a whole load of a culture that needs to be embraced when it comes to the technology. We know what works today. We've got technologies that do the data collection uh, in some shape and form. We know we've got um, uh, mobile devices that are being used. We know we've got some kind of massive kind of uh, uh, financial and, and, and reporting capabilities that we have in-house today. But some of these are, I won't say outdated, but some of these could be modernized in a little bit in a, with, a, with a tweak here and there to start doing more. And so what do I mean by that? So let's take a look at some of the examples here. Using AI and automations, agencies can use advanced techniques to convert documents that are on, on paper, on PDFs, on some kind of formats, to then convert them into a format that's easily and, uh, easily and understandable as um, uh, to be understood easily. They can be converted from, uh, without having manual intervention, to convert things like handwritten signatures, they, things like uh, uh, documented reports, collected through different means and putting it into a structured database. The growth of mobile devices, iPads have risen. We've seen instances of agency employee and contractors using mobile devices to collect data um, at disasters by taking photos or even performing data collection. So to avoid having to retype all of that information that they need to do at a moment a disaster hits. We've started seeing um, uh, uh, agencies uh, use IOTs and sensors and even drones for early warning detection systems. So for example, one state we know has implemented the use of flood sensors to start getting a sense of the flow of water and use that as an early uh, alert notifications to individuals and citizens and emergency first responders. The use of advanced analytics has also uh, progressed um, to perform things like fraud among the reimbursement process. Um, we know, for example, instances where individuals um, or uh, contractors have, have reported uh, two uh, of their employees, apparently, or one of their employees working at two separate sites at the same time. Not possible, 
but these are the kind of things that you can start collecting and analyzing on the moment you have all of this data in a, in a digestible format. Another one is equally important is my belief is the ability to share data. Um, we know with um, blockchain, for example, in emergency management, it allows for interoperability and transparency. Um, it, it allows for multiple parties across the system to coordinate um, resources in an emergency. So in a disaster relief scenario recently, we know states that have used, um, uh, have, have the ability to start find, uh, connecting the dots between missing people to hospital admissions, to all of these other kind of resources to be able to quickly answer mail from, from citizens and loved ones looking for, for themselves to, uh, to other kinds of uh, use cases and scenarios on that front. Even the CDC has started to look for pilots to use this kind of capability and innovation as part of the next pandemic. Knock on wood, it doesn't happen, but in case the next pandemic does happen in this scenario. Next slide, um, Chris. So what are some of the six ways technology and innovation can, can really help you um, in the short term to short to medium term in that? One is with using an innovative smart grants platform to manage the end-to-end -end process for FEMA reimbursements to understand the risks of procedure and policies in place for entities to all to, to be able to from from the moment you do understanding risk of entity submissions all the way to project closeout and even getting reimbursement. The idea is to be able to have a central repository, a central location for being able to submit and process all kinds of documentation and allow for states to be able to review, analyze, and be able to quickly um, provide reimbursements based on FEMA's guidelines and policies. Number two, using devices in the field to collect data as they are, as when and then they are deployed and perform near real-time analysis of the data. We know instances that um, during a recovery, for example, we know individual contractors and, and employees that have to go to the field to start collecting some of the data in terms of the, the amount of debris they're collecting or all of the other uh, pieces of information that they need to collect. There was a device or a set of devices that they can use to start collecting that then and there and then be able to report back once they get back into a Wi-Fi connected uh, uh, location or their home office, they'll be able to share all of that information. As I alluded earlier, uh, using an early warning system to detect a natural disaster. Um, one other state, for example, used um, uh, uh, early warning sensors to detect uh, the, the, the sense of fire departments and, and alerts using AI and complex capabilities they were able to understand what alerts and which respondents need to go based on certain kind of uh, uh, warning detections and algorithms based on that. Using automation and workflows to have reviews and supervisor sign off in hands off from one person to another, being able to alert and uh, informing others when to know, when to pull out certain documents and certain elements from documents, which will be the crux of the next set of slides that Samantha and I will speak to. But again, a lot of this is really tedious, manual, and tough. And oh, I mean, let's be honest, we're all human at the end of the day. So there is a amount of fat fingering that can happen when you're trying to convert almost thousands and thousands of pages of documentation into a well-structured um, set of uh, uh, data sets that you can then analyze and review and, and uh, continue the process of the reimbursement. And then lastly, uh, which Chris Bali will talk to in the, in the second half of the, 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 the section is around using techniques and anal analytics to optimize and evaluate the supply chain delivery during pre and post disasters. We know that there is going to be a lot that's on your mind as when a disaster hits, and hopefully supply chain is probably the one less thing that you can worry about. And Chris will go into more detail about how you can use advanced analytics to sort of um, create efficiencies in your supply chain um, during a disaster. So next, we'll talk about how one state was able to use automation to expedite the reimbursement process. Samantha? Thanks, Bobby. Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the recovery challenge, and then we'll get into the reimbursement process. Um, you see on the screen, there's a few examples. Sean, I'm sure you would agree, and most of our recovery folks here on the line will agree that this does not begin to cover nearly as many of the challenges that our, our, our state and local governments face um, during a disaster. So th again, there's a lot of challenges that arise for state and local governments when responding to a disaster. And, and we would all agree that recovery should not be one of them, but unfortunately, oftentimes it is. So these states, local governments, private nonprofits, all eligible applicants are spending so much money, large amounts of sums during and post disaster 
while trying to get their entities back to these pre-disaster conditions and still trying to ensure that they are in compliance with the copious amount of rules and regulations that the federal government, states, your own you know, rules and regulations you have to follow. So a few recovery challenges that we see on the screen that I wanna to touch on that the potential applicants might face include, you know, big one, delays in reimbursement. And this is oftentimes due to incomplete or inconsistent documentation. Also budget shortfalls, since FEMA public assistance is a reimbursement program, um, you know, that, that does, you know, unfortunately room for, for your, your budget and your entities, if you're a local government or, or you know, a state, you know, you're, you're not able to cover it. Also possible deobligations due to documentation and consistency or lack of standardization across documents and, and ultimately across the process. Next slide, please. Okay, so now getting into the recovery, the recovery process. We'll dive a little bit more and discuss, you know, possible challenges and as well as solutions. So a lot of the challenges discussed today that Bobby had, you know, mention and I will mention are around the data and the documentation that's required in order to develop and substantiate these, these applicant, uh, these reimbursements, right? So let's take category A debris removal into, um, as an example, between the low tickets, the truck certifications, the invoicing, the invoices, all the required documentation that you must provide to FEMA and then sometimes to the state and then sometimes to other vendors as well. This adds a lot of time, a lot of additional time in, in entities. I know we have, we have you know, a, a bunch of different entities in here, but you're a local government or a state government. This actually adds a lot of time um, back into you getting your, your funds and getting those funds back into the community. And to top it all off, it, the data can be unstructured. And, and we see oftentimes handwritten documentation, um, handwritten load tickets, handwritten truck cert. Um, I'm sure it, it was probably the only you know, possibility they had at that time. And you gotta do what you gotta do to, you know, while the storm is happening or right after, um, but it is really hard to read the load tickets you know, that are not standardized, that are not you know, possibly automated. Um, and that leads to maybe a more manual review and also adds more time to our process. And finally, um, there's an eligible cost due to, you know, unsupported or again, lack of documentation. Um, so this is an inclusive list. Like I said, you will find that some of these are probably most reoccurring challenges surrounding documentation and the reimbursement process, but we can, we can be here all day talking about all the challenges in, in, in recovery. And Sean's telling me, yes, let's move on to more, less challenges. So now to the solutions. So we'll, we'll go a little bit into a, a use case, um, but possible solutions in, in all of this documentation really is, you know, applicants, local governments, entities, you know, vendors utilizing these user-friendly forms with automated and, and data-driven processes. And combined with a powerful AI, this could really help digitize, classify, and integrate your data into one system. So I think we're gonna move on to what a, a, a good, uh, low ticket scenario document received and I'll turn it back to, to Bobby. Thanks, Samantha. So in the in the use case that Samantha just alluded to, um, we worked with um, the, the, the state agency um, took advantage of trying to go into, hey, there's got to be a better way, almost like a line from Shark Tank. But they, they really wanted to find a way to say, hey, how do we how do we help automate some of these processes uh, in, in relation to the documents that you see here? So the state agency focused on three types of documents for now, the low tickets, the unit tickets, and the truck certs. And they understood that there was a massive number of um, variety of types of tickets, uh, types of truck certs, and um, they, there's different vendors. All of them have their own formats. They all have their own kind of like templates, et cetera, et cetera. And so you'll notice in a lot of them in, in the above for the low tickets, there is different pieces of information. Hopefully they have a lot of the same elements, but they have, diff as you can notice, just without reading anything, as different structure, different templates. You look at the unit tickets, there is a mix of graphical information with regards to what they've taken from photos, as well as some of the data that they're collecting as part of the unit tickets so that they can claim for their reimbursement. Similarly, the truck search follows, the, uh, follows suit as well. Some of it's gotta be handwritten. Some of it is not as legible as Samantha alluded to. 
They've got different formats. So all of this is just a massive kind of you can you can you can see the massive amount of work to for someone to sit down and almost read about fifteen hundred or so, or sort of fifteen fifteen thirty fifteen thousand uh, um, documents and a boatload of of pages to be able to convert it and put it into a worksheet or into a into an Excel workbook uh, to even start doing the the different rules. And we haven't even covered things like doing fraud analysis or any kind of like business rules to apply to this kind of data. Uh, next slide. Um, so it, what the state did was, with taking advantage of the automation, you'll notice that we have about 12,000 and change in terms of documents, 400,000 or so types of pages, as, as I showed on the previous page, uh, the previous slide, 10 different tickets types, variety of them between low tickets, unit tickets, and truck search, four different vendors. And what, what we realize is what would have taken almost hours, if not days, if not weeks, for an individual to sit and be able to convert all of that documentation into something that's legible, um, structured, and be able to apply your business rules would have, has been has been uh, brought down to about ten minutes. And this is now not someone that's just uh, uh, converting it. This is literally a machine able to review these documents and convert it into a structured format into ten minutes or less. And this is now a repeatable process. So every new low ticket that we get. Every new load um, ticket, the, the uh, truck cert or unit ticket that the state gets, they're now able to put it through the machine to be able to just automatically do that conversion. There might be a few sampling uh, uh, um, um, in situations to just uh, validate and, 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 and review the accuracy of all of that conversion from both the data itself to actually the conversion of the outputs to just make sure. But apart from that, um, the, the accuracy and the ability to convert that was really reduced to about 10 minutes. And that now tells you that you've got reviewers and, 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 and employees that can now go do more, uh, I would hate to say important, but more um, uh, tasks that are not mundane and repetitive in nature and let the machine do, it, do what it's supposed to do, which is help you help you as much as possible. And when you get all of this data into the next slide, um, Chris, when you get all of this data, there is so much. There is everything from the operators, the, the time, the date, the amount of, of debris that they're removing, um, potentially invoices. You can expand this to time cards, time sheets, et cetera, et cetera. You've got this amount of data that's now sitting in some kind of a data repository that you can now act on. The first thing you would probably do is once you put all of this data into, an, into a, a set of worksheets that you can start doing analysis on. Number one, it helps you with streamlining your reimbursement process by doing the validation. You can start putting in automated checks, automated, um, uh, um, automated uh, uh, business rules that can start flagging things as and when the data is reviewed and put into the system. Number two, the fact that all of this data is already in here it's it's almost like it's 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 bonus, and the reason why I say it's a bonus is because you now have the ability to do what I would say sometimes is fraud analysis. Now, whether it's intentional fraud or or, or uh, an abuse or whatnot, you start mining the data to be able to get some of this information. So things like is uh, is a contractor now reporting in two places, two different um, uh, places in the same state at the same time because of of uh, them being able to know that maybe the state doesn't have a sophisticated system that someone's looking into from a fraud perspective. Is, are they using the same equipment? Are they using the same kind of information at the same time frame? There's other, maybe there's a duplicate piece of information that's dead. So this is all part of the activities that I would say that could be streamlined and automated. The fact that all of this data is now in a structured format that's A, already um, uh, transposed from all of that material, from that PDF to the data collection to all of that, and put into some kind of a data repository that you can now act on uh, in some shape and form. So I'll pass it on just to give one more, um, I would say to, to for Samantha to give an opportunity to share where that opportunity of automation can kick in and let her speak to that as well. Next slide, oh, thanks Chris. So I know this, this screen might seem a little busy and I'll break it down into three possible scenarios. So keeping in, in mind the use case that we just discussed, if you, the amount of hours it would take, you know, to the current state process, which includes, you know, the, the, the manual load tickets I just mentioned and the manual truck cert. Um, in aggregate, it was taking about 91,000 hours per year to do all of that. And now if we move on to a, a more simplified process, maybe you still have some handwritten low tickets, you have some 
um, that are automated, uh, the amount of time it was going to take, you know, to still monitor the state's queue and, and approve the projects and then populate the Excel spreadsheets, you know, everything that you're seeing going across. Um, it was it was a saving of 7.4 by using AI, but still keeping in mind that you do have some some manual labor included. Um, so this was a potential saving of, of about 6,000 from that 91 original uh, thousand I just discussed. Now your third scenario at the bottom, this is full automation. Nothing is handwritten, you know, assuming everything is, you know, all automated, um, same processes, but now you're able to automate the process about 75% and it's going to save you about 69,000 hours of manual labor. So what does that mean? I know I have other vendors on the line and nobody wants to discuss that, but and ultimately this means that it's saving the state, you know, the local government's money. And, and as Sean would agree, you know, like let's, let's automate this, you know, saving money, we see dollar signs. Yes, absolutely. So by keeping in mind the, the items that Bobby had just discussed, what we touched, uh, touched upon a little bit ago, you know, using the AI, you trying to in, install these types of softwares and, and, and these solutions in your entities will save you not only time, but it possibly will save you a lot of money in the end as well. I'll turn it back over to you, Bobby. Sean. Well, well uh, Bobby and Samantha, thanks for that quick demonstration of uh, application of uh, artificial intelligence. And I would offer Samantha accelerating the payment and repayment to our, our localities and to the state uh, is, is also re really important. And that's what, uh, in this case, uh, what artificial intelligence has done for us. So, so uh, we have a couple of questions and we have time for a couple of questions. So I wanted to pitch this first question. Um, actually, there's a comment uh, from, um, and, and this is a great point, you know, application, data entry, grant reporting requirements are undaunting tasks for small uh, emergency management offices. And that's a point well made. Uh, we have to find, policies, procedures, and techniques uh, to really uh, reduce our overhead and the complexity, because let's face it, we're trying to manage a crisis. Uh, we don't need our enabling processes to also be a crisis. Um, from uh, uh, Carol Lynn, uh, I'll, I'll present this question to the, to the panel. Uh, how does this address the use of these tools when the incident area is an area not covered by the internet service? Um, they're from a county that, that includes hundreds of miles of, uh, you know, uh, limited re uh, uh, broadband access. So uh, I certainly can weigh in, but uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts, Bobby and uh, Samantha. Yeah, so great question. Uh, we get this a lot, actually. So some of the things that we've advised on and what we've seen in other states uh, do is that a lot of their apps that they're using on their phone is able to store some of that data um, uh, temporarily on your phone. So it's basically stored on your in device memory on your device. So all of the data that you're collecting, all of the data that's being um, uh, transcribed and, 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 and collected on the field when there's no broadband, the intent is to have those apps store that uh, all that piece of information onto your device and it keeps it there. Honestly, it keeps it all there. And the moment you're back at your office or your employment location or someplace where there is a connectivity, then the idea is that you can now sync that device back up to your central repository where your main system is. So think of it as no different than you trying to open up uh, um, uh, 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 the notes in your in your phone uh, on an iPhone, for example. And if you use the notes thing, you can type in all your comments, all of your things. And when you get back connectivity, it can now sync up to the iCloud. So very similar concept of storing the data offline. Sean, I wanted to make sure you had a dwell in case you have one. Yeah, and, and I'll, uh, I'll pause. Uh, Samantha, did you have anything you'd like to add to that one? No, I, I think Bobby made a great point. Um, of that's one potential use. Um, you know, and I mentioned, oftentimes you might not have that is like available to your entity due to budget constraint, because that's one of the challenges that we said. Um, so you, you might have to resort to, you know, the handwritten documentation. It, it's ultimately, it's not the ideal thing, but it, but until we, you know, entities are able to adopt the use of AI and, you know, and, and, and able to adopt these tools, um, you know, that, that I would say that's probably the best, uh, you know, case scenario. Um, and I think I hit on uh, Amanda's point as well there too, you know, the, we're getting there. <laughs> no, no, I really appreciate that. And, and I think the implied task is, you know, as emergency managers at the local and state level, uh, what resources and other technologies can we, uh, you know, layer with artificial intelligence. And for example, uh, we're taking a look at uh, 
you know, creating uh, mobile uh, wireless mesh networks with satellite backhaul. You know, up in the mountains of Western Virginia, we had catastrophic flooding and uh, the cell phone service is not present because the, the train is so rugged. You'd have a tower uh, within, you know, a mile, you know, every mile, and that's just not sustainable. So we're actually conducting uh, AI work or, or, you know, internet based cloud work and uh, with a rolling type wet uh, mesh network, which which seems to be effective. So we're extending that broadband temporarily. Um, I, I really like Amanda Height's question, and I think this is an interoperability kind of uh, data, data management. How, how do we get to full automations with all the different entities? Let's face it, we're, we're in the public space, multidisciplinary, multi-agency space. Um, so how, how, how would you automate in that type of environment? So great question, Amanda. Um, and Samantha, I'll have you chime in here because one state is trying to help with using standardized forms for the data collection and the reimbursement process. But more importantly, I think at the end of the day, what 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 the state needs to do is and have an interagency um, an agreement to have in place well before a disaster. There's no point trying to figure all that out during a disaster. But the idea is that interagency agreement and also potentially federal. Uh, being able to tap into a day, I would call almost like a data hub, the ability for all of that data to be shared into a centralized data hub and for every agency to subscribe to that data hub to have an agreement of what is the data that we are willing to share? What is the data that's um, uh, uh, that we're in agreement to? Because there are some PII concerns about some of this information, right? We had a recent disaster where um, hospital missions uh, a state was tracking hospital missions, uh, missing missing uh, people as well, and they need an ability to uh, be able to understand uh, how to be able to share that information with all of the first responders because the police department's getting called up and saying, hey, do you know if XYZ is safe? Do you know if XYZ is in a hospital? And they too need to be able to tap. So I would say that at the end of the day, what I've seen in other states or what we've also advised is uh, interstate interstate agencies need to have a way to be able to share through a data uh, mechanism. A lot of states have like a, um, a, a, a CDO or a CIO or some kind of a technology office or a technology agency that's responsible for the overall governing policies for the agency for 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 the state. There needs to be a way to help them to try to bring that all that data and have them be the central focal point for managing that subscribe and 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 uh, of that information. No, thank you, Bobby, and I think we have. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one more question because uh, we do have a second part of this uh, uh, panel, which I'm really excited to hear about. So uh, for this this final question, um, um, I'd like to ask really an application, you know, from your experience, you know, uh, working in this space and working with some emergency management organization, what, what would the best way for an emergency management crisis leader uh, get started or, or begin leveraging uh, artificial intelligence? Yeah, um, uh, great question. Um, it's it's tough because you don't. There's so much out there. You go you go to Google. I mean, um, I don't get paid by Google, but if you go to Google and just type in uh, artificial intelligence and emergency department, you've get you've got a boatload of information that you get there. So what I would say is that first talk to your IT team. They you would be surprised the number of times that your IT team within your agency probably already has certain level of tools already that may be able to be pivoted in a slightly different manner to help you with your goals of what you're trying to objective. But I also say sometimes it's okay to ask for help. Um, talk to talk to um, and, and a third party vendor that you may have an agreement with. The third, talk to some agency or talk to some consultant, talk to someone that says, hey, I'm looking to do X, Y, Z. Can you just help me figure out what I need to do and navigate my pathway to go get, um, to go get uh, what I need done from an AI? But just to be clear, I want to be very super quick because I tell this to all my clients as well. Don't think that technology is going to solve everything or AI is going to solve all of your problems. Sometimes it's also about the business process. So the AI, you, you'll need to understand what your business, as, you, as Samantha alluded to in the previous slide, understand your business process and then try to identify where can AI automation, any of these kind of innovation capabilities be entered to then address and help you solve that problem. That's how I would begin with is understand what you do today and where you want to strive to go to. Thank you, Sean. Hey, thanks, Bobby. Thank you, Samantha. It's fantastic. We, we have a joke here. Uh, it's respectful. Uh, IT means in theory, but you're absolutely right. You have to have the processes in order to leverage the technology. So 
uh, we appreciate that. So we're going to go to the next slide. I'm just going to quickly open. I'm going to be very brief, but I, I want to set the stage. You know, we're going to take artificial intelligence and analytics. And we're going to take it a little step further and, and look at the supply chain and demonstrate the power of uh, this concept of a digital twin, where we can leverage AI to understand networks, to understand uh, complex systems better. And, and then, you know, one of the most uh, relevant application is understanding our supply chain. We've learned in the last couple of years that the supply chain is fragile. There's some really unique relationships that frankly, we don't understand. Uh, however, our plans for emergency operations are based on, hey, we think Walmart's going to have the stuff we need, or, or maybe it's PPE. So bottom line, uh, as we listen to our next discussion, take a moment to consider how you could use artificial intelligence and the digital twin technology, because we could use it for many things beyond supply chain. So I'd like to introduce Chris, uh, KPMG's uh, supply chain leader for state government. Uh, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. And um, and hi, everyone. I wanted to uh, uh, sort of piggyback on what Bobby said at the beginning, which is about how it's very interesting to us to see public sector agencies uh, be more willing to adopt best practices that have proven to be successful in the private sector uh, to solve all sorts of problems. And we've, we're seeing that right now play out in supply chain. Um, and um, there's no better example than that, I think, than, the, than this digital twin topic. I would bet that if I polled the audience right now and asked you if you know who's familiar with the digital twin, not too many people would raise their hand. Um, but the reality is that companies have been using technologies like this um, to really stress test the resiliency of their supply chain. And it's really picked up in, in, in popularity since COVID hit, as you can imagine with all the supply shortages that, that companies dealt with. Uh, what we want to do today is talk about what this digital twin is. Um, I want to start at the beginning and, and sort of peel the onion back a bit and explain what a digital twin is. How does it actually work? What does it mean for emergency management? And then even some of the benefits that companies, organizations that have used it, what have they found with it? So you can get an understanding of what might be expected within the world of emergency management. But um, let me start at the top. You know, what is a digital twin? Right? A digital twin is essentially... Um, a, a digital replica, computerized replica of some type of physical operating system. So that could mean, um, when I say physical operating system, that could mean uh, something as specific as an asset, like a vehicle, a bus, a train, uh, a, a piece of equipment. Um, it could mean an entire facility and all the operations that happen within that facility, or it can mean an entire project or an entire supply chain. But the reason why you go through the trouble of creating a digital replica of something, of the system, is because what you want to do is you want to be able to simulate, looking forward, how operations will be carried out if, if faced with certain conditions. It's almost like you can make up a disruption of some kind and say, how would we perform if faced with these disruptive conditions? Some of them are even intelligent enough to use market signals to forecast disruptions, but what it allows you to do is understand what's happened before the disruption actually takes place so you can understand you know, just how resilient, um, resilient you can be. If you understand, obviously, the vulnerabilities of your, of your supply chain or of your operating model, now you can kind of take protective measures to, to, to mitigate that risk. And again, all sorts of organizations have already used this to say, okay, if, our, if one of our suppliers were to go out of business or we were to face a severe supply shortage of some kind um, or see a surge in demand, how would we likely to respond to that? Now, in the world of emergency management, you can start to understand the use cases here. Before I go into that, though, I just want to spend a minute on how this actually works, because some people, when they hear that definition, they, they might assume, OK, well, that sounds ultra sophisticated, almost like something that's out of reach. Um, it's like a far-fetched science experiment of some kind. But, but here's one of the key points I, I, I'd like everyone to take away from this, which is uh, this digital twin concept is something within the within the reach of every organization. It doesn't matter where you are on the maturity curve. It can exist in different forms and fashion, obviously different levels of sophistication, but it is not something that is only for the most progressive, most innovative organizations. A great way to understand that is to simplify it using an example that I think everyone would understand, which is a computerized game of chess, right? This has been around for a while. We've been able to teach machines how to play chess for a while now. And you can imagine that if two people 
were to engage in a game of chess and they were to stop halfway through the game, it wouldn't be too hard for a machine to pick it up and simulate how that game would be carried out, right? Who's likely to win? How many moves is it gonna take? How much time is going to elapse? Where will the positions, the pieces be positioned when it's all over? And, and the reason why it's able to know that is because we can make a machine smart enough about the environment it's trying to simulate so that it can run a simulation that we can trust. So like in the game of chess, for example, like we know the positioning of all the, play, of all the pieces. That's one critical input. We know the rules of chess, right? We know the outcome of the game we're shooting for, and we know the movement of all the pieces. Um, we might be able to tell it, you know, the skill levels of the players as an example. But if a machine knows all of this, it's not too hard to understand how you can roll this forward. A machine can be relied on to simulate the outcome of a chess game. Well, if you take that same concept and you apply it in emergency management, then the question is, what's the environment that we're trying to simulate and how could we set that up and how could we inform a model? How can we make it smart enough so that it could run a simulation of, of, of a certain operation that we can, that we can trust? So this is one way to do it. There are ways, but you know, you can think of it as, especially with the lens of supply chain, you know, think of it as supply and demand, right? On the right side, we've got demand. You've got different emergency events that we need to be prepared for, right? We've got different residents, right? In impacted areas that we need to serve the needs of. Um, and if you keep working your way back, you know, there are different channels of supply that we rely on to to, to get and to distribute essential products, right? We have our own warehouses. We get uh, products from FEMA. Uh, we can get products from other warehouses within the state, but from other agencies. Um, we can borrow or, or, or get products from other state uh, uh, emergency management departments. We can go to the commercial sector and go straight to manufacturers or distributors or retailers for that matter. And they all have an ecosystem, right? They all have facilities, they all store inventory Right, and they all rely on suppliers. And so the question now is, if this is our environment that we're trying to replicate, what information could we give a model to make it smart enough to run a simulation of some kind if faced with certain a certain disruption? So, for example, you can pick a, an event. Let's say we pick a hurricane, and we we can right off the bat say, okay, we we not only are are facing this hurricane, but we care about the provision of certain products at different levels of, of criticality, right? Well, what else could we tell a model? We could tell a model a lot about the event itself, the time, the date, the duration, the severity of the storm, the location, all the, 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 the area, the geographic area that's been impacted by it, all the roadways that are accessible or not accessible. We can do the same thing for residents, right? We can understand more about the residents that we're trying to serve, right? Where are they located? What are their demographics? What are the characteristics that we need to know about that tells us a lot about their need? What do they have access to transportation? How close are they to retail stores? Things like that. We can work backwards up, up the supply chain and start to understand current inventory positions, right? How much supply do we have in each of the channels that are listed here that we're gonna rely on? What's the health of the inventory, right? In, in, in the form of condition, the age, right? You can look at, purchase orders or orders that have been been placed already that we're just waiting to receive. So you could tell you a lot about the products that we're expecting that we're expecting to come in and the dates that have been promised and maybe even contracts that are in place with certain distributors or manufacturers in the commercial sector that gives us access to supply if an event were to happen, right? We'd wanna know that as well. Um, we could give it information about the, the facilities uh, within each of the channels. So where's he, where is he, uh, how many warehouses are there? Where are they located? What are the capacity of those warehouses? How are they staffed? How automated is it? What kind of equipment is in those facilities? What's their processing speed and the productivity of it, of each of those facilities? And then working all the way back to the suppliers, you know, what products do we rely on them for? What are the dimensions and the weight of the products? Well, how many products are in a case? Uh, where do they have their warehouse locations? Um, you know, what mode of transportation do they rely on? What's their typical lead times or maybe ordering constraints or pricing, especially for expedited shipping? And what kind of historical performance record do each of the suppliers have? So you know how consistent and how reliable they are. You can even go, you know, marry up the lead times of demand and supply. And there's a lot more that you can put in. And we just wanted to give an example, but 
going back to our chess example, right? You know, again, if we can define our environment and and put in enough information into a model to make it smart enough about that environment, then and be specific about a question we're trying to answer, then there's no reason why we can't trust a machine to carry out uh, a simulation and show how how operate, you know, what how, what the outcomes are likely to be. Now, someone could say at this point, okay, this is a lot of information, and where's all this going to come from? And and you know, not, not all this is in one system. And I go back to what Bobby and Samantha were saying in the previous section. There's a lot of there's a lot that can be done today with data engineering that gets you over this hurdle, right? So it's not a question or an issue about data not being available, um, or not even a question about data being good. Most of the time, it's just about data engineering. How can you efficiently get a hold of the information you need from all the different places, all the different sources, it's in all the different formats, but how can we make that more efficient in terms of getting it and integrating it so it can be used in the form of a bottom-up model? With today's data engineering tools, everything that you're looking at here, as long as it's captured somewhere, um, the, the process of getting it into one place and, and being able to work with it in one place is a lot easier today than it's ever been before. So if we, if we now move ahead and say, okay, if we were to do this for emergency management, what types of questions would we answer with it? I, I have to say, it's very important when you get into um, thinking about a digital twin and, and, and could this work for us, you have to be very focused on the exam question you're answering, because otherwise you'll run the risk of doing a simulation that doesn't really lead you to anything meaningful, right? So as we've talked to emergency management departments around the country and shown a digital twin and show, actually showing it in action, and we talk about use cases, these are just some of the use cases that have been mentioned frequently by these teams. I thought we'd be, it'd be interesting to just run through them quickly with you here. An obvious one is, you know, if we were faced with a certain event of certain characteristics, how long is it going to take for us to run out of essential products, right? Or when would a certain percentage of the population that we're looking to serve dip below an acceptable level of supply? There's another way to think about that. Um, based on that, you know, what other sources of supply should we be prepared to tap into? Um, not just, you know, at the event or, or spontaneously, but but can we take protective measures and maybe pre-secure supply uh, in the event of some things happening? Now, think of this as like an option contract. You can get yourself into an agreement with a, with a manufacturer or a distributor that says, if an event were to happen, certain emergency, we would get a certain portion of your available inventory at a predetermined price, rather than just you know, being in reactive mode and trying to get as much as you can at, you know, at, at the time. So th th there's a way to actually use a digital twin to determine the value of such a contract. Um, or what are the optimal points of distribution? Now, it's not a new concept to do you know, center of gravity analyses and things like that, but think about it. If you get smarter about the residents that you're looking to serve with this, and not every resident's the same in terms of need, then what does that mean in terms of the best places to, to distribute products? You know, um, it's not about getting a certain, you know, prepackaged food and bottled water and fuel into the territory, but getting it to the people who need it most. And if you know that, then you can be, we can more intelligently understand where to set up your optimal points of distribution and how much product needs to be at each point. And that tells you a lot about the last one on the left, which is, if we have a limited number of supply, amount of supply now to distribute, where's it best to put our, our you know, th these resources rather than just equally spreading them across the, um, the different points of distribution. Um, on the right, you can, you can not only look at it as an event by event situation, but, but maybe across different events, maybe for an upcoming period or upcoming season across all the products that you, you manage in the warehouses. You know, which ones, which products really come to the top in terms of being most at risk of not having adequate supply, and therefore we need to change the way we manage this inventory or we, we replenish this inventory. Um, what about from an infrastructure standpoint, you know, if, if you, what if you could actually use a digital twin to simulate the impact that uh, would, that would take place if you were to lose access to like a major supply chain artery, say a port, a bridge, a tunnel, a roadway, of some kind. And it's not just the impact to 
um, you know, the safety of residents, which is obviously incredibly important, but also maybe you need to understand the impact, the commercial impact, the economic impact to businesses that are in, that are in your territory. Um, the next one's interesting, labor. You know, we, everyone thinks of supply chain as the provision of products, but what about products and services? You know, the, the provision of labor is just, you know, obviously as important as the provision of, of, of products. And you can do the same thing for, for labor. You can do it for labor, products and equipment, if you think about it, and the synchronization of, of, of all three. And then at the bottom, you can see, you can also aim this at shelters. You know, where should these shelters be located, the capacity, the supplies, and so forth. There are many others, but, but you know, I think if you, if you are able to create this digital replica, make a model smart enough about all the different parts of that environment and pick a very specific exam question that you're trying to answer, then, then this technology is really at your fingertips to be able to run these simulations, know where you're vulnerable, and then do all these little what if scenarios that if we, if we take action, what would be the impact to the KPIs that matter most? Now, let me talk a little bit about these, the, the, the what if scenarios, because I think it's important. You know, you, you can imagine that if you want to do a scenario analysis, it, today it's probably taking someone quite a bit of time, a lot of effort, to put information together and say, okay, this is what the impact would be. If we do this, this is what we would expect. But when a digital twin is set up the right way to address a very specific question, now all this is at your fingertips and you can do this dynamically. So you can actually say, okay, let us define the, the event, let us define the products, let's define the impacted area and what's accessible and what's not accessible. Let's talk specifically about roads and bridges and tunnels and ports that are accessible and not accessible. Let's redefine how we look at our residents by, based on need and prioritize them based on need and use that to define the best points of distribution. Let's activate different channels of supply like we talked about before and show how by activating every new channel of supply, you know, what it would mean for reaching um, the, the residents we're trying to serve. What does it all mean from a cost standpoint as well as a performance standpoint? And then when you look broadly across different types of events, obviously different types of severity, you know, what's that tipping point from when we, we go into a, a, a more severe storm, let's say, or a more severe event, where we start from a supply chain standpoint, we move from being safe to being somewhat at risk to being seriously at risk. So we can start to take protective measures for those types of scenarios. Lastly, I just wanna uh, end with, with a little bit about the benefits that companies have seen with this. As I say, this is not a new thing in the private sector. Um, there are lots of great examples to showcase where you can, you can learn a lot from that in terms of what a digital twin is and how it's used and what it can do. Uh, this is a, a summary of the, of the benefits that companies have, uh, have achieved with this. Now, I, I understand companies have very different use cases. Um, so, you know, the story is still being played out in emergency management, but if there's anything to be learned from the successes of companies, you can see there's just double digit improvements across the board in terms of the costs, the operating costs that, that, that can be saved, the inventory position that you can, you can improve, right? Reducing the amount of inventory that's on, but still improving performance by, in some cases, 35%. Um, minimizing product loss, you know, not overbuying and having to write off products when they expire. And the overall user experience is another thing they measure. And you've seen a two or three X multiple of improvements in that. So real significant benefits across the board. I think uh, just, to, just to summarize, uh, I, I think digital twin technologies are absolutely within the reach of every Every team, no matter where you are on the, on the maturity spectrum, I think the key thing to, to start thinking about if you're interested in this is, is what qu exam question am I trying to answer? What would be the environment that we're trying to replicate? And then what information could we get our hands on, right? That we could target, we could aim for, that would make a model smart enough to produce a simulation that we could trust. And if you can start to see other digital twins that have been developed and what good looks like in, in other use cases, it'll really help you go through that thought process and understand what a digital twin can do for you. So Sean, I'm gonna wrap it up there and hand it back to you. I'm sure there are questions. Yeah, there absolutely. Are questions. absolutely, Chris. And, and so ladies and gentlemen, we're absolutely uh, open up for some uh, questions of, of, of the panel and, and Chris here at the digital twin and just a fantastic technology 
to understand complex systems. And things I think about are supply chain is definitely uh, an opportunity, but placements of shelters and understanding our communities. But how about resiliency programs and, and trying to figure out how we can leverage uh, the whole of government approach at the federal and state level by using uh, those programs as inputs and the output it would be those projects. So there's all kinds of really exciting applications to this concept. Um, and so uh, uh, for, from Carol Lynn, uh, we have a question and I think this is, this is a, a great lead in. Um, this is an exciting concept uh, for the program uh, uh, that she's building. Um, how would you get started? Like if Chris, if, if we had an emergency, if you're an emergency manager, how would you get this, the ball rolling and get a digital twin uh, program? Yeah, I, great question. And, and, you know, what I would recommend uh, for anyone interested is, look, we today we only talked about this for about 20 minutes, right? And, and uh, just in the, in the conceptual form. I think for anyone who is seriously interested in this, I think it would be a good idea to get a look at a digital twin in action. It could be from the private sector, because that's where really where most of your, your, your benchmarks are. But, but take a look at one, understand the use case, understand what the digital twin is and what it's doing, how it's built, how does it work, how, why is it trusted? And then take that and then start with that knowledge, start to pinpoint the use cases, these exam questions, that if you had something like this that worked for emergency management, what would you aim it at? I mean, you you don't want to start with too big of a, a, a of a bowl of questions here, but you know, if you pick a, a two or three exam questions that are that would move the needle the most, which ones would they be? And then and then um, with that, you can start to unravel. Like I say, what does the environment what environment do we need to sim do we do, do we need to replicate? What is the inf what information could we would we need to capture? Right to put into this, it, there are lots of experts out there who can who can if you need it can walk you through that that process. But start with the use case because start by looking at some of them in action, so you get a better understanding of what's possible and what good looks like, and then start with the use cases, pinpointing two or three exam questions, and then kind of un, un, unravel it from there. No, thank you, Chris. And I'd like to open up this next question to the entire panel, both uh, leveraging AI and the digital twin side of the house. Um, because I think the panelists may have some thoughts, but, uh, and it's about cost. Like how, how do emergency managers pay for this? So in both case studies, uh, it, you know, today, both examples, um, maybe Samantha could speak to opportunities to fund uh, those AI efforts. And maybe Chris, you have some, uh, and uh, Bobby, you get some additional. So uh, Samantha, I'll put you on the spot. You know, can, can we use overhead and management costs to, to, to do some of this work? So in, in, in one of the states, we did see that it, it was partially funded by, you know, essentially that the vendor took on the cost when they were doing the work of the reimbursement on behalf of the state. So it was on the Cat Z, the category Z um, that, was, that was funded. I would say another um, thing I've seen is just le legislative budget requests, really. It, it was requested through, through there, um, but it is something that, you know, depending on which vendor you're utilizing or if you want to do it in-house, you don't have to, you know, if you, you have people in-house, you don't have to go through a vendor. Um, also, that's, that's what I've seen, especially for, you know, the reimbursement side, because it's, it's stuff that you have to do anyways to get your cost out to, to the local government. Um, so I, I've seen that go through, through the CATSI. Bobby? No, I mean, yes, as part of the administration, as part of the admin feed, you could you could you could take it a little bit of this out to to do the payment, but no, not anything additional to what Chris and, and Samantha already shared. Uh, thank you, uh, Samantha and Bobby. And uh, uh, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I, I'd like to pitch one uh, at Chris. You know, um, what other state or local agencies beyond emergency management are considering using the digital twin, you know, theory? Uh, what are some of the most attractive use cases that you're seeing or maybe uh, whiteboarding right now? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, it's it's really fascinating when you think broad, more broadly across state and local government, uh, the different use cases for this. Um, I could tell you, of course, emerging management is, is one of the big areas, but outside of that, we're seeing a lot of excitement in transportation, right? You think about a major project to build a, a bridge, highway, uh, a, a tunnel, of some kind. What if you could replicate and simulate how a project would be carried out and teach? So you know where your where the key dependencies are, 
but then be able to forecast disruptions before they happen. Now, if you know, for example, that a, a certain point in the project, hey, we're at risk of being in short supply of a critical material or, or labor resource or equipment, then you can, ba you can bake uh, protective measures into your contra supply contracts so you say, okay, well, we're going to force our general contractor or subcontracts to buy buy the stuff in bulk, buy it up front, or take a face a penalty if it's not if if a cer certain outcomes exist downstream. So things like that are, are really interesting. Same thing with building uh con building construction. An, an, another good example. You can think of it in in education. Believe it or not, you know what if uh, look as an, exa an example what happened in New York City during COVID. They, they bought five hundred thousand iPads and sent them directly to students at their homes. You know, what if you could, uh, you know, stimulate the, the 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 movement of school issued remote learning devices or any other product for that matter that goes directly in the hands of students? What about congestion pricing? You know, it'd be amazing to simulate the movement of vehicles in a certain part of, of an area to have a more intelligent way to structure structure that. So and what about health? You know, if you think about the, the products that are purchased and managed by any state hospital, you know, what if you can anticipate supply shortages um, before they would happen, you, you, you can take protective measures as well. There are lots of really cool use cases um, beyond emergency management. And that's why I think this is such a uh, attractive opportunity for many different parts of state and local government. Well, Chris, that's a great segue. If you go to the next slide, I just want to wrap up with a couple of comments. I'll turn it over to Karen. And bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, the emergency management uh, field is a profession and we need to be expanding and growing. And today's conversation was really about how to leverage technology to be innovative, to solve some of the complex issues that we face, challenges to be more efficient and effective. But the one goal in mind is to serve our communities better. Uh, with that, Karen, back to you. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you to KPMG for supporting today's session, specifically to Sean, Bobby, Samantha, and Chris uh, for sharing your expertise with us. Thanks also to our great audience for participating. Um, you can find out more about the NEMA Empowerment eLearning Series and how to sponsor one of your own on the NEMA website, www.nemaweb.org. As a reminder, there'll be a short survey coming to you via email, and we would appreciate your feedback. The webinar recording will be available soon on the NEMA YouTube channel, NEMA for You. Thank you again for attending. Take care, stay well, and have a productive rest of your day.